since time began. Mankind has sought the answers to life's greatest questions. It is a burning desire that has driven both nations and individuals to consume and conquer all frontiers set before them in a search for ultimate meaning. The quest for answers has taken the human race to the very ends of the earth and beyond. Yet, despite our greatest achievements, there remains one as yet unconquered final frontier, death and the life beyond. And it is this frontier that holds perhaps the true answer to all life's mysteries. It's medically inexplicable. Hello, I'm Ron Bailey. Welcome to the Lazarus Phenomenon, the program where we seek to answer that one most intriguing question. Is there really life after death? Every person has probably asked that question at least once in his or her lifetime. Do we cease to exist the day we exhale our last breath? Or is there more to it than that? In this program, we'll be talking to experts in both the medical and the scientific fields, as well as to people who've literally been to hell and back and experienced a heaven beyond their wildest dreams. So join us, if you dare, as we enter into the Lazarus Phenomenon. Where do we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? Is our existence on Earth merely a product of chance, a random act of cosmic coincidence, or is there really another world beyond the seeing eye? Since earliest times, most cultures have displayed a belief in life after death. The ancient Egyptians believed that when they died, they too would make a journey to another world, where they would lead a new life. They consequently paid vast amounts of money to have their bodies properly preserved, as they believed they would undergo various tests on the other side. Similar beliefs can be traced back to the great civilizations of Greece and Rome, and various cultures as far afield as the Mayans and Incas of South and Central America, the Khoisan of Southern Africa, and the Aboriginal peoples of Australia. In later times, particularly in the Middle Ages, life was dominated by a fear of demons and the terror of damnation. Throughout the ages, poets and writers voiced their own interpretations of the teachings of Jesus and what the biblical authors had written of heaven and hell. One particular story related by Jesus himself was of the rich man and Lazarus. There was a certain rich man clothed in purple and fine linen. And there was a beggar named Lazarus who laid at his gate full of sores and desired it so to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table.
Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And so it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels unto Abraham's bosom. man fared sumptuously every day, feasting and dining to his delight. But it came to pass that he too died and awoke in Hades. While in torment, he looked up and saw Lazarus and Abraham afar off. Father Abraham, have mercy upon me. Send Lazarus to the piece of finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in agony in this fire. My friend, remember that while you lived, you had everything good and Lazarus everything bad. Now he is at peace, and it's you who are in pain. And besides, there's this great chasm between us that no one can cross over. Abraham, please send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brothers. Do not let them come to this terrible place. Your brothers can read what Moses and the prophets wrote. That's what they should pay attention to. It's, it's not enough. If someone from the dead were to go to them and tell them, they would turn to God. If they won't pay attention to Moses and the prophets, they won't even listen to someone who comes back from the dead. But is this belief, this seemingly universal human instinct, merely the product of superstition and religious doctrines? Or is there actual scientific evidence to support it? Today, scholars and religious figures are certainly divided. Some talk of reincarnation, others of assimilation into the universal life force. Nobody knows for sure, or do they? Towards the end of the 20th century, a phenomena arose in which people reported near-death experiences, otherwise known as NDEs, in which they encountered some form of afterlife reality. Modern medicine began referring to these occurrences as the Lazarus phenomenon, after another biblical character, also named Lazarus, who was revived by Jesus four days after his supposed death. But just what is near-death experience? Dr. Jeff Long elaborates. Well, as the name near-death experience implies, these people have some event in which they are severely physically compromised. Generally, there is a severe physical malady that occurs very suddenly often or at the end of a chronic illness. 
Near-death experiences are very frequently associated with cessation of heart function or cessation of breathing function and very often both. And given that 10 seconds after that, that the EEG, a measure of brain electrical activity, goes absolutely flat, it's medically inexplicable that near-death experiencers are having a conscious experience. There's so much more evidence behind something more going on with near-death experiences, something that is not medically explicable. There are blind people, including people that are blind from birth, that have near-death experiences, and for most of them, it's a visual experience. That is absolutely medically inexplicable. These are people that are blind that for the first experience in their life where they've had vision and can see things in the world was during their near-death experience. There is no other explanation for that. Time and time again, we hear accounts of people that have their near-death experience and their consciousness separates from their body. So from a vantage point of their consciousness apart from their body, they're able to see and hear what's going on around them while they're being resuscitated. Uh, very often they can see incredible detail of, this, of the events going on around them. Out of all the near-death experiencers that I've studied that had their consciousness come apart from their body and where they were seeing earthly everyday events, uh, essentially all of them, what they describe, has been absolutely plausible. And of all the near-death experiencers I've seen who actually went and sought out verification of what they saw while their consciousness was apart from the body, uh, every single time, with only one exception, what they saw was as, or heard was absolutely correct. And there is no explanation for that, for consciousness apart from the body at the time you're having a cardiopulmonary arrest. To people that think that near-death experience is not legitimate, I would remind them that there's at least 12 to 15 million Americans that have had near-death experience. This is such an enormous number of a shared experience that so greatly affects their life that no matter what the cause of near-death experience, no matter what your idea is about why it occurs, I think there's no question, given the number of lives that it's impacted, that it makes sense to study it. It's an incredible phenomenon, and again, the implications are enormous. A medical practitioner who has experienced this firsthand is Dr. Melvin Morse of Seattle's prestigious Children's Hospital. The near-death experience is, in fact, the dying experience. We will all have this experience when we die. The interpretation of the experience is in dispute. Nevertheless, it's a scientific fact, not a belief system, that we will have this experience when we die. There have been three major scientific studies of near-death experiences in the last 15 years. And all three of these studies document that these experiences are real and they'll happen to us all when we die. So the old ideas that these experiences are caused by a lack of oxygen to the brain or are hallucinations caused by chaos in the brain at the point of death are caused by the drugs that are given uh, to uh, patients uh, that we resuscitate uh, when we're dying. Those ideas um, were, of course, respectable scientific theories, but turned out to not be true. In fact, near-death experiences are the dying experience, and that's a scientific fact, not an opinion. I think in terms, yes, certainly in terms of the consistency of the testimonies in near-death experiences, it suggests that the, the experience is a reality which is not purely the product of brain chemicals, because I mean, we know from studies of the effects of drugs ordinarily that if you give one person a drug and then give the same drug to another person, they'll have two completely different experiences. There might be broad similarities, but not the level of consistency you find with a near-death experience. Science cannot give us the definitive answers to our questions about the afterlife. Not yet. Until it can, our best source of information is the human experiences of those who have undergone death and seen the other side. One such story is that of Daniel Ekechukwu, an African pastor who lay dead in a mortuary for three days, yet lived to tell the tale. Let's join him now in Nigeria, where he tells his story of how he was raised from the dead.
children. How are you, children? Christmas for the Ekutuku family was always a time of celebration. Celebration of the birth of Christ and the love of friends and family. Hi, Dad. Yo, I've got a goat for you. But this time, things were different. On the surface, everything seemed fine. But inside, Daniel was boiling with anger and unforgiveness. <laughs> he had recently fought with his wife and was still harboring deep resentment. That I had a quarrel with my wife on Thursday. And the little quarrel I had with my wife, I frowned on her. Then on, 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 on Thursday night, she was knocking on my door. I couldn't open the door for her. Then on Friday morning, she now knocked on my door. No, on Friday morning, she woke up and I come out. She said, Daddy, good morning. I did not accept, I did not talk to, I didn't talk to her. I kept quiet on her and I left on Friday morning. She offended me, she did something wrong and I, I was angry on her, I was annoyed. Daniel's anger had so blinded him that he had not even seen his son that day. Mommy. Yeah, my son. Where is dad? He went to, to deliver God to grandfather in a word. Okay, but Soon, my son, go and play. Daniel's thoughts that day were somewhat distracted, almost as if his mind were somewhere else. When you go back there, you greet your children, greet your wife and family. I'll do that. As the sun started dipping down, Daniel began to speed up, wanting to get home. He was still very angry. Nigeria's inner city side streets are notoriously undeveloped. A bumpy ride, to say the least. Daniel knew well to travel cautiously. But that day, the car seemed somewhat sluggish and unresponsive. As he headed down one of the dirt roads, he reached down to apply the brakes. But there was no response. Daniel began to pump the pedals furiously, but to no avail.
So he came back uh, lamenting uh, Auntie Mommy that a uh, pastor is dead, that he saw a group of people carrying him on his uh, head, going, moving down there. So the moment I heard him screaming and I heard that pastor is dead, I knew he's my husband. So I, from that upstairs, I ran down. I began to run towards the place where the accident happened. When Nega arrived at the scene of the accident, she learned that Daniel was still alive, but in a very serious condition. Bystanders had taken him to the local hospital where Nega found him. After being rushed to the intensive care unit at Barunyu Hospital, Daniel refused to be treated. Instead, he insisted that he be taken to his family doctor, all the way out in Oweri. I must go to Dr. Mizrake. It's our family doctor at Oweri. Family doctor? It's what my husband wants. The hospital surgeon told Daniel's wife in no uncertain terms that he was in no state to travel given the extent of his injuries. In the head. Yeah. He's concussed. He's confused now. Mm -hmm. And he's in no composition to decide what's best for him. But despite the surgeon's pleas, Neka was adamant. It's what my husband wants. If he leaves now, I'm afraid he will die. That's and I'm not certain of that. When they discharged us that night, they said I should sign that I'm uh, taking him on my own risk. Then I had to do it. So we took him to his uh, private doctor to worry. On our way to that place, uh, he called me. I should take care of the church and the ministry and the children. Take care of the children and the ministry. Shh. Don't try to talk. I have good your house. Please don't talk. Uh, Some are called early and I'm... When the ambulance that took me from the hospital and my wife they were on a high speed rushing me to another better hospital. So um, suddenly I, I, I had some feelings and um, for me to look up, I saw two angels. When Daniel saw the two angels, he wanted to let his wife know, but the angel indicated that he should keep silent Immediately, Daniel's power of speech was taken from him. Nega began to cry, fearing that Daniel would die. The angels took Daniel by his shoulders and lifted him out of the ambulance. Suddenly, Daniel found himself in another place with one of the angels. Daniel. I have a lot to show you. As he looked out, Daniel saw a place where a multitude of people gathered, and their appearance was like that of the angels. Their color was pure white, and their bodies seemed to glow with radiance. Because of their similar appearance, Daniel thought he was seeing a gathering of the angels. Meanwhile, the ambulance rushed to St. Eunice's Clinic in Oweri. Neka and a friend of the family waited with bated breath 
as Dr. Jose Anibunwa examined the patient. Where's Nega? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, there's nothing I can do for you. I'm sorry. This is the death certificate. Give it to the mortician. He'll take care of you, okay? I'm sorry. That place, the doctor came and they checked him. After checking him, he discovered that uh, he's dead. That uh, no, more, no respiratory organ, that everything he sees, that we should go away or we should deposit him in his own uh, mortuary. Then to me, I disbelieved him. I said, no, that my husband is not dead. He cannot leave me and go like that. This is not the gathering of the angels, Daniel. This is the gathering of the saints. The differences between the saints and the angels were subtle. Their color is a pure, brilliant white from their hair down to their feet. But the difference is that the angels have wings while the saints do not. The saints were worshiping God they worshiped God with one voice and raised their hands as they were singing. Daniel heard the sound of many instruments and the sounds were like nothing he had encountered before. He longed to join these people and moved over towards them, but the angels stopped him. Daniel. Don't go. I have a lot to show you. Take this file and record everything you see. The multitude that Daniel saw were all looking at a bright light that shone like the sun. It was the source of all the light there. A very thick, heavy light coming upon them there. Now, they were all looking at that light as if they are seeing something there but to me I cannot look at that light can you I cannot look at that light because um, it's so dangerous to my eyes so I try to dodge to look through but there we are looking through but to me I cannot look through Daniel's body was taken to the mortuary where Burlington Manu, the local mortician, arranged the burial. So we'll start the environment procedures. I will need a thousand naira. Then you get me the gloves, his dresses, and you get the coffin ready. Then you give me two days in Tava before you come for the collection. Is that all right by you? It was on the 30th of uh, November, 2002. That was the day they brought uh, one Reverend Daniel uh, Eki. He died on accident uh, case. That was the day. Brought by the father known as Mr. Lawrence uh, Eki Inhuba. Then after the treatment, I gave some injections, some meals about, this is five mil uh, syringe. I gave about six syringe to the fingers and the toes to treat before the embalmment. The 30th of November 2001 was a date forever etched on Nenka Ekechukwu's heart and mind. In fact, she remembers it well. Uh, that very day, uh, it was terrible and horrible, and I was sorrowing. Then the word of God appeared to me in Hebrew 11.35.
women receive their dead body back to life. So when I read that scripture, I said, uh, dead bodies back to life, uh, dead bodies, dead bodies. I began to meditate over the word of God. I said, dead bodies, my husband is one of the dead bodies back to life. I must take him to Bonkers Crusade so that he will come back to life. Let's visit the mansions Jesus prepared for his people. Immediately, Daniel was in a new place with radiant mansions as far as the eye could see. It was incomparable to anything he knew on earth. Though the appearance resembled buildings, the structure was unusual, not made of any earthly materials. They seem to be alive, moving. Daniel, Jesus has finished his work. The mansions are ready, but the saints are not ready. There was a sound of beautiful singing and worship, and it seemed to come from all around. Daniel wondered where the singing was coming from because he could see no people there. Daniel, the worship song you're hearing is being sung by the flowers. As he looked, Daniel saw the flowers swaying in response to the music. It actually seemed as if they were clapping their hands, shouting and praising God. They are waiting for the saints. It was around uh, between 12 1 midnight when I came out. I started hearing some noise over here. I wondered maybe the churches, uh, I mean the church people over there, maybe they're having crusade or something like that. And I keep on hearing singing and praises, clapping. I wondered. One of my mind told me to come down, maybe that happens in the mortuary. We are now going to visit hell. Can you see the gates of hell? The angel raised his hand, and as he brought it down, the gates ripped open with a great noise. Daniel could hear the crying and wailing of many people, but he could not see any of them.
And then he liked Sean from the angel's body into the darkness so that Daniel could see more clearly. There were many people there, but unlike the souls in heaven, the appearance of these people was as it had been on earth. They were from every race, culture, and nationality. Every person seemed trapped in their own personal torment, a torment which would go on for eternity, and they could not communicate with others. The sounds of crying and wailing were almost deafening. Suddenly, they all seemed to become aware of Daniel and started crying to him for help. And they called to Daniel only as if they could not see the angel. after the pastor made the statement, the force that was tormenting him seemed to increase. The people had flesh, but no blood, and they almost seemed to be on fire, although no flames could be seen. There was a group of people that were eating their own flesh. They would vomit what they ate, and their flesh grew back. This carried on in an endless cycle of torment. Those people you see eating themselves, they practiced witchcraft while they were on earth. They specialized in eating human flesh, and now they'll eat themselves forever. They are reaping what they sowed. That place is not good for any human being created by God to go. And God did not make that place for human being. He made that place for the devil and his agents. But stubborn human beings who will disobey God like the devil will also go there. God have no mind to put any human being in hell. It's a dangerous and a deadly place he made for the devil and his people. What was to follow was an earth-shattering statement by the angel. Daniel couldn't have imagined in his wildest dreams that he would hear the judgment. Daniel, if the book of your life was to be closed today, this would be your portion. No. I'm a pastor. I'm a child of God. I'm born again. <laughs> and I preached all over this, this country. I mean, the, the country in which I'm... This, this, this can't be. No, no. This can't... Enough. Daniel, on your way to the first hospital, you were asking God to forgive you, but you would not forgive your wife, and your sins have not been forgiven. It is a matter of reaping what you sow. You cannot sow unforgiveness to your wife and reap forgiveness from God. <laughs> and immediately he made that statement. My spirit convinced me that what the angel told me or the judgment on me is true. I didn't say no because I remembered that I had a quarrel with my wife on Thursday. And the little quarrel I had with my wife, I frowned on her. Then on, 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 on Thursday night, she was knocking on my door. I couldn't open the door for her. 
Then on Friday morning, she now knocked on my door. No, on Friday morning, she woke up and I come out. She said, Daddy, good morning. I did not accept. I did not talk to I didn't talk to her. I kept quiet on her and I left on Friday morning. Are you getting what I'm saying now? Because my wife provoked me. She offended me. She did something wrong. And I, I was angry on her. I was annoyed. So I didn't accept her great. I left on Friday. On my way coming back, I had the accident and died. So now the angel told me that my wife offended me and I did not forgive my wife. And I come to God and ask God to forgive me that I am not forgiven, that this place should be my portion. I now cry. I did not say no. I did not reject the judgment. The judgment was true to me because I know in my heart I was angry with my wife. I was trying, I was thinking of what to do on her. I was thinking of my wife slapped me. My wife slapped me. What am I going to do to her? What am I going to do? I was thinking of what to do. So in my heart, I was annoyed, and I believed God was judging my heart. So he said to me that I didn't forgive my wife, that I'm not forgiving. So while I was crying, 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 shouting and shouting, I was not crying. That, that I was only saying, you see how I destroy my soul? Look at how I destroy my soul. While I was shouting and crying, I was afraid. Tears was all over me. I was panicking because... That place is not good for anyone. And, and the way everything was looking, nothing, if, if God went to put me inside hell, nothing would prevent him. Because uh, while we are discussing, some group of people, thousands of people, we are being sent into hell. Then in me, I concluded in my heart that I must do something to make sure that my husband is revived, that I believe that uh, he must come back to life if I should do, make a step of faith, that something good I come out of it. Papa? Papa? What? We'll take his body to church. What? Guinea? We must take Daniel's body to church. Madame, my daughter. Daniel is dead and he's gone. He will come back to life. I know it. Neko's father-in-law dismissed her request to remove the body from the mortuary. But meanwhile, on the other side of town, things were working miraculously in her favor. As early as 5.30 to 6, I left my house to, with the address tracing the dad which in uh, Amimo Ikeduro. Then when I asked of the, the man, Reverend, I mean, the man, Mr. Lawrence uh, A.K. Ihuba, then they directed me to him and I told him to come and remove the corpse that they brought inside my mortuary. They claimed that she died on accident uh, case because during that time he was bleeding. Yeah. Then I asked them to come and remove the body. I saw some kind of uh, signs. I don't know what is wrong with the cops. I don't want anything to hurt me because this job is a tedious job. It's a dangerous uh, job. Morning, job. What brings you so early? I want that body out of my mug. Why? Why? Things happened last night. What thing happened? What happened? Sounds of music coming from his room. Oh, calm down. The music may have come from the village where villagers marry in. What has that got to do with the dead? Not that. What exactly? This is no dream. There were music coming from his room. Yo, but tell me, were you drinking last night or what? I didn't drink anything. I mean every bit of it. And we took him from the mortuary, we dressed him up and uh, put him inside the gasket. Then we took off from Oweri. Then we continued coming down to Onesha. Um, his glorious cathedral, Grace of God Mission, Anambara State. That was Aguleri, Omuleri Road. We are Reverend Bonke, Rehad Bonke, serving crusade. That let Rehad Bonke pray for him that he will raise again. <laughs> I started laughing. So this comes, they say, yes, okay, give me the tally. 
she went aboard the tally and cleared their bill. They would dress the body when I dressed the cops. I called on my assistant to join me. They hired an ambulance. They went and bought a coffin, the white coffin inside the rope there. I said, okay, I'll go with two people. Let me witness. Maybe it is the power of God or anything that happens, I will know. So when we arrived there with our um, siren, there was tension all over. Security people came, both the church security, the one they signed from local government, even from federal government, even the one that came with bunker. Some of them, they thought that we um, evil people that came to bomb uh, bunker the first time. They were pushing me left, right, and center. Then I was withstanding their pushing and their torment. They were abusing me and calling me all sorts of names. Then so at the time I told them that he's dead, he's even a man of God. You people should not um, kill me. He's a man of God, only that he had an accident and uh, died, that they should allow us to take him inside so that Bonke can pray for him. And I believe that he can come back to life. The security guards refused them entry into the premises, thinking they might have a bomb in the casket. The procession was redirected to a facility in the back of the church. Daniel was taken out of the casket and laid on a table. People started praying for him, praying for resurrection. Then the angel said to me that he's sending me back to the world to go and warn this generation because this is going to be the last warning to this generation. As prayers was going on, then his heart began to pant. Life began to come in his heart. They continue praying, we are praying, we are praying. As all these things were going on, he began to breathe gradually, but his body was still stiff. I saw myself being held of a lot of people. Oh, I was naked, I was wearing only trousers, they pulled all my dress, I saw a crowd of people, more than 20,000 people. I looked my left, right, everywhere. People were shouting, crying everywhere. Some, were, some was praising God, some was crying, some was, I was looking around, I couldn't understand what was happening. Because to me, I was falling down and I fell into pit. And to me, when I opened my eyes, I, was see, I saw all hands was grabbing me. They, they said to me that I jumped up. I saw this big cathedral, it's a very big cathedral. I looked by my right, my left, my front and my back. Everywhere was full of people. And some people were shouting, some were saying coffin, some say mortuary, some say three days. I couldn't understand what was happening because uh, my experience there is not more than 15 minutes, so I don't know what they call about three days. To me, there was no night, there was no day, there was, it was only that moment I was into. I now uh, said to my wife, yes, what is happening? She said I should keep quiet until when we get to the house. Brought me back to my house, this place with my wife. So when we get inside the bedroom, uh, that's been on 2nd of December, I asked my wife, what is happening? What, 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 what about coughing and two days and mortuary? What is happening? Then my wife now begin to look at my body where they injected chemical and she said, Dad, did you know you was in mortuary three days? And this the death certificate, you know. Uh, while I left the ambulance, uh, they, they still went to the hospital. So the doctor now confirmed uh, that I, I, I have died. They now use their equipment check. According to, you can see, uh, they, they check the heartbeats, everything, the, 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 the eye pupil, everything, according to the doctor. He, after checking everything, he now confirmed that I was totally dead. He now gave them certificate that I sh they should remove me. You can see it here, say, uh, uh, remove for mortuary. 
Accounts like these have had an enormous impact worldwide, causing ripples even amongst the medical and scientific professions. In the past, such occurrences were viewed simply as hallucinations caused by hormones produced by the body during extreme trauma. But experts are not so convinced. Hallucinations tend to be very disordered experiences, and they're nothing like the highly ordered and structured experience that you have with near-death experience. On my website, I specifically asked the question, was the experience dreamlike in any way? And I've actually recently done a formal study of that. Near-death experiencers are emphatic when asked directly, and I did, was the experience dreamlike in any way? The answer is a resounding no. It isn't close at all to a dream. Dreams tend to bounce around a little bit. They don't tend not to have order or structure. Uh, very often a dream will end without it reaching a logical conclusion in the sequence of events. Not so with near-death experiences. They're highly structured, highly ordered. They tend to have a very logical initial part of the experience. And at the end of a very orderly and structured experience, there's a very orderly and structure end, structured end of the experience. And that's when the experience ends. Near-death experiences are nothing like dreams. If you've had a frightening near-death experience like some of those that I've described, there is no question that when you have that experience, this forces you to look at yourself. This is something that really shakes up your life in a major way. You've really got to sit down with yourself and ask yourself, why did this happen? What's really going on here? Is this the reality? It really forces you to understand what is the reality of what's going to happen when I die. Dr. Richard Kent, a retired medical doctor, has studied the NDE over many years, traveling the world and writing books on the subject. Of the 300 case studies he has made, an alarming amount report the existence of a realm similar to the one encountered by Daniel Ekechukwu. It's just a horrendous, awful place. It's a place where people are terrified, are frightened, um, and people even just who've seen hell, even years later, they recall in horror of what they saw there. Just a place of awfulness. Um, I've interviewed probably over 300 people who've had these experiences, um, and all of them have been dramatically changed. Their lives have been changed by these near-death experiences. You can't say that about hallucinations. Hallucinations simply aren't life-changing experiences, whereas a near-death experiences, um, when you meet Jesus Christ and either see heaven or hell, they are dramatic, riveting, life-changing experiences. And Almost invariably, people's lives are dramatically altered as a result of these experiences. So, personally, and also because of the fact that the near-death experience accounts are so uh, remarkably similar, not only to each other, but also to the Bible, I personally believe that these, these are real events and people are describing real events. If you read any newspaper today, you'll talk about, you'll, you'll read about people having a near-death experience of a type leaving their body and going along a tunnel and, meet, and going to a place of light. It's only one who get, those who get really close to who recognize Jesus Christ. Um, they describe him as nearly six foot tall, but radiating li uh, light, tremendous amount of light coming from him, um, from his face and from his chest and from his arms and from his legs. Um, but people, it isn't just the appearance of Jesus, um, it's the fact that they feel in the presence of so much love. Um, many people said they've never felt, they've never felt like that. They've never felt so completely um, surrounded uh, by love, as powerful as that. It's just incredible love. Though scientific research has shed a lot of light onto the subject, it is only those who have experienced firsthand the reality of a life after death that can truly give us insight into what happens when we die. Like Ian McCormick, a native New Zealander, McCormick would undergo a life-changing experience as a result of his extraordinary encounter with death and the life beyond. Fact or fiction? You decide after seeing the following episode.
in 19, I think about in the 19, late 70s, I saw a movie called Endless Summer that depicted some young Californian kids with their surfboards traveling the world looking for the endless uh, summer, no winter, and the perfect wave. It captured my heart and I thought, well, that's me. Traveled for two years through Australia, Southeast Asia, uh, Bali, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, and ended up sailing down to a small island called Mauritius. And this island had great surf and great diving. I surfed there, dived there, lived with the local Creole fishermen, Simon and Daniel de Doom, in a place called Tamarin Bay. Guys. No, wait, Ian. Are we going diving tonight? <laughs> diving tonight? Yeah. Oh, the weather doesn't look so good. That's yeah, good. <laughs> okay. down there you could see the fluorescence in the water you know you lift the water up and the fluorescence just sparkling beautiful night and we came down to Riviere Noir which is on the outer reef and dropped in and we started um, getting crayfish If this is the best you can do, I'm going back to New Zealand. Hey, 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 don't make this, man. You feel? You will wake up the shark. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, mate. It was quite dark as the clouds were coming in, so there was no real moonlight, and there was a little bit of a chop on the water. diving uh, on the island they told me to night dive this is a dive on the outer reef and as we dived we'd, we'd look with our diving torches because the crabs and the crayfish would come out and with your torchlight you could blind them and with your leather gloves just pick them up
So I looked around the water and started making out these jellyfish, box-shaped, finger-like tentacles. I thought, well, is that, a, is that a jellyfish? Yeah, it must be. So I reached out, and sure enough, it was a jelly. As I swam through, I had no idea that I'd just reached out and grabbed potentially the deadliest, some say the second deadliest creature known to man, a box jellyfish, obviously, because it's box-shaped. But it's transparent, bell-shaped, with cube, like a cube underneath the bell, with finger-like tentacles coming out. I actually thought it was like a transparent cuttlefish, or a, it was a very unusual looking jellyfish. Something smashed in the arm and stung me. And it felt like thousands of volts of electricity went through my arm, so it literally shook me in the water. As I swam towards them, I started getting stung by more. He got hit a fourth time. right arm, which was paralysed, trailing in the water, got hit with a fifth one. As I felt that, I thought to myself, what on earth have you done to deserve this kind of punishment or payback? I had a flood of memories of stuff that had done wrong in my life. And here I am thinking, well, there's no use thinking about that, whether I deserve it or not. I'm dying. I better keep my head together here. As the young boys pull me through the lagoon, I'm sitting there as calm as possible, but I feel the poison move into my kidneys like someone stuck their fist into my back as the poison continue to move down the right-hand side of my body. As I hit the beach, the young boy motions for me to get out. I take one step forward and my right leg crumples underneath me and I realise the poison has already numbed or paralysed the right-hand side of my body. And this young kid carried me up across the sandy beach, which is really hard. Amen. Amen. Uh, man. Uh, yeah. Amen. Man, uh, right. Man. Man. Amen. 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 Right. Man. Amen. 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 Man. I realize he's afraid for his brothers on the reef. I just lay down on the ground and I started to feel very weak and tired. I feel my eyes beginning to shut and as my eyes begin to close, I hear a voice speak to me. It says, son, if you close your eyes, you shall never awake again. I said, what? Who said that?
As I looked to my right, I expected to see a man standing next to me, but there was no one there. I said, that's bizarre. But I knew I'd heard a voice speak to me. Close your eyes, you'll never awake again. I thought, that means you'll die. What are you doing trying to go to sleep here, you idiot? This is a coma. You can't afford to sleep. You need any serum, any toxins. See, I intellectually knew this as a lifeguard, but here I am confronted with the fact that this poison's just taking me out. And I'm unaware that I'm on the edge of potential coma and, I believe, certain death. So I stood up, fought off the, t the, the, the death that was coming on me as best I could, and found my left leg was still strong enough to support my weight. my right leg as a crutch and put my weight onto the left hand side of my body and hobble down the road looking for help. If you close your eyes, you shall never awake again. Hey. <laughs> How are you? Hey. Hey, how's it? How's it? How's, how's the it? clients? Are they done yet? <laughs> hey, look at this guy. Oh, drunk surfer again. <laughs> <laughs> hey, help me. Oh, please. Please take me to a hospital. You got money? Yeah. Yeah. I'll pay. <laughs> How much you got? Fifty. A hundred US. Anything. <laughs> uh, you guys drink too much. Crazy. As they walked away lighting up a cigarette and just ignoring me, I heard this voice speak to me again. It said, son, are you willing to beg for your life? Please. Please. How much you got on you? I will pay. I will pay you. How will you pay me, huh? Don't worry. I'll pay you, I promise. Where do you stay? I stay in a bungalow. Tamarind Bay. Okay. I'll drop you at the Tamarind Bay Hotel. Wait. Hospital. You got no money. I'm going to drop you there. No. Please. Please. You got the money? No. no. Get out. No. Get out. Later. Get out. Why Please. you do this to me? Uh. I flew out the door. I couldn't believe what was happening. Please. As I lay there, I could hear the familiar voice of a Creole fisherman from the village, Danielle. Ian. Ian, what's happened? Jellyfish. Uh, Jelly, jellyfish. Jellyfish. I'll take you to the hotel. He grabbed me in his arms, he carried me into the hotel. The Chinese owners had closed the bar, and here next to the swimming pool, they were sitting there playing mahjong and drinking their whiskey.
Wait till end. I'll get an ambulance. Hey, white boy. What's the matter with you? You drunk? No. No, please. A hospital. Please. I need a hospital. A hospital. What's this? Stupid boy. Why do you put needles in your arm? What? I'm cold. Please, I'm cold. I need a blanket. I'm cold. These guys think I'm a drug addict and I'm nearly dead. Stupid boy. Stupid boy. I'm cold. So cold. Help. Yeah. 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 Try to take some. Please take me. Please take me in your car. Please take me in your car. No, 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 no. I think you wait for an ambulance, okay? He wants my car. I looked away. I knew if I looked at him, I'd lose it. I thought to myself, if I, if I survive this, you're history, Jack. I mean, I was furious. I'm looking away, contemplating what I'm going to do to him if I survive it. And I see Danielle appear from nowhere, runs up to my side, and to my amazement, an ambulance comes flying to the car park. Hurry, hurry, it's a jellyfish. Please, hurry, please. Jellyfish? Careful with him. It's all right. It's all right, Ian. It's all right. Don't worry. Don't worry. You'll be all right. As we race towards the hospital, I start to see on the inside of the ambulance what appears to be a small boy with white hair. I see sections of some kid's life with snow white hair. I then realize as I'm looking at it that this is me. This is sections of my own personal life. I thought, am I that close? With my mind, I did a mental check, you know what I mean? Of my own vital signs. My mind told me I am very close to death. As I'm lying there, I think, well, I, tr I could be that close to death. I may not make it. Well, I'm lying there having no idea what to do next, and I see appear before me a clear vision of my mother. She looked straight up into my eyes. She said these words. She said, Ian, no matter what you've done in your life, son, no matter how far from God you may be, if you ever call out to God from your heart, God will hear you, and God will forgive you, son. I thought, well, if there is a God, which one? I'd seen thousands. I'd travelled through Kandy, Sri Lanka, been to Bora Badur. I'd been to so many different places. And I'm lying there, I thought, okay, God, if you're real, show yourself. I used to say, if unless I see God, I won't believe. Well, I lay there, I'm going, show yourself and I'll pray. No face appeared. My mother kept saying, pray from your heart. God, if, you, if you're real, this is real. Uh, uh, help me to pray. Uh, help me to pray the only prayer I've ever learnt. Uh, help me to remember the Lord's Prayer. Uh, As I said that, words began to appear before my eyes. Forgive us our trespasses and sins. I thought, how on earth could God forgive me? I mean, it's too late. I've done too many things wrong. God. God, if 
you are real and you can hear me, please forgive me. More words appeared. Forgive those who have trespassed and sinned against you. Either that means forgive other people. I can do that. I'm not a vindictive person by nature. God, I can forgive anyone. No matter what people have done to me, I forgive those that have sinned against me. As I said that, the face of the Indian taxi driver appeared in front of me. I thought, what on earth is this man doing here? The boy said, will you forgive this man for pushing you out of his taxi tonight and leaving you for dead on the side of the road? I thought, no, you must be joking. Not forgiving him. I mean, I was furious with that guy. And the next minute, the Chinese guy's face appeared in front of me. I thought, what on earth is he doing here? And the voice said, will you forgive this man for not taking you in his car tonight and leaving you to die in the hotel? I thought, no. As I saw both of these men's faces, I thought, what on earth is going on? This isn't just some mumbo-jumbo prayer. I could actually be talking to someone who could be God. This voice is actually personalizing this prayer to me. God, if you can forgive me for my sins, I'll forgive those men for what they did to me. Their faces instantly disappeared. The next words came, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I thought, Thy will? I've led my own will. So I said, God, I need to know your will, but if you can help me through this, I'll seek it out. I'll find it and I'll follow you. I'll honor you all the days of my life. As I said that, the entire Lord's Prayer appeared before me, and for the first time in my life, I had total revelation of what it meant. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And as I lay there, I felt an amazing peace settle upon me. I knew somehow, deep in my heart, that prayer had changed from something that I did, like repetitious stand up, sit down and kneel type thing through the liturgy. It had changed dramatically, and that I actually prayed for my inner man. What happened? What's wrong with him? Stung. Jelly. Jelly? Jelly. Jelly. Sir, Sir, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Or do you get the antitoxin ready? Sir, Sir, can you hear me? Get the antitoxin ready! Try to stay awake. Doctor, I, I can't find a vein. Slap his hand. Come on, take it like this. Slap his hand. That's all we can do for you right now. Fight the poison. Fight the poison, okay? And I could feel myself going. It was, a it was really scary. You could hear everything. Well, I lay there and I had doctors milling around me and nurses and orderlies, but I found it so difficult to keep my eyes open. I just couldn't seem to keep my eyes open. I remember shutting them and sighing a sigh of relief and thought I'll have a break for a few moments and then I'll try again.
As I did that, I felt a sensation like a release. The battle to stay alive had finished. I suddenly found myself in a standing upright position, wide awake. I knew I was awake. The trouble was, it was pitch black. And my first thought was, why on earth did those doctors go and turn the lights out in here? What kind of hospital is this? As I stood there, wondering how long I'd been asleep for and why the lights were out, I thought, well, don't freak out. Let your eyes accustomed to the dark. Maybe you've woken up too quick. So I kept looking thinking my pupils had dilated, no light, couldn't see a thing. It was pitch black, like a dark room. So, well, well, okay, there must be some light in here somewhere. So I turned around 360 degrees, checking out to see if there's some light. Couldn't see a thing. As I went out to my right, I couldn't find the wall. I thought, that's weird, have they moved me? So I started moving back to the left, groping around looking for my bed. Couldn't find it. I thought, great, you idiot, now you've lost your beard. How on earth did you do that? So as I'm groping around physically trying to find my beard, the next thought that comes into my mind is that it's so dark in here, you can't seem to see your hand in front of your face. So I brought my hand up to where my face should be, and it seemed to pass straight through, as if there was no physical form there. I thought, that's impossible. You can't miss your head. I went for my physical body, absolutely nothing. I thought, what the heck's going on? It's like I'm out of my physical form. It's like I'm transparent, yet I have the uh, sensation of being a total human being standing here. Ian, who I am, appears to be standing here. What's happened? Yeah, and as I stood there, I began to sense something on the, out to my right looking at me. In front of me, I felt like invisible eyes of something or someone checking me out. The darkness had an evil presence, a cold, encroaching evil pervading the atmosphere. Where, where am I? Shut up. stood there realizing I could actually be in hell. A radiant beam of light pierced through the darkness above me. As this light touched my face, I felt an awesome presence go through me and my entire body seemed to lift off the ground and be translated up into this light and radiance. As I've been drawn up into it, I can see that it's coming from a circular shape opening far above me. I feel like a speck of dust being drawn towards this light. As I'm being drawn up towards it, I thought, is this real? I look back over my shoulder and far beneath me, I could see the darkness. Still not understanding what this light was, I began to move up to the opening, enter it. As I was drawn into the opening, I could now see that it was a tunnel. As I looked along the length of it, I could see the, the source of the radiance. My first thought is the center of the universe. Look at the light. Look at the power coming from there. As I've been moved towards it, I watch as a wave of radiance comes up. As this wave of light comes off the source, it touches me and I feel warmth, comfort. All that kind of fear and darkness just seems to go out of me and I feel a living, light go through me. Shafts of radiance came out from the central core. It was like a white fire. Phenomenal radiance in the central core. From that, I watched this brilliant light piercing out. And I thought even the stars in the universe, even the constellations must find their energy source from this focal point. What is that light? Is there someone in there surrounded by this radiance? As I question that in my own mind, a voice spoke to me from the center of the light. 
The moment I hear his voice, I recognize it to be the same voice that spoke to me in the ambulance, telling me to the Lord's Prayer and whether I'd, whether I'd forgive. And he said, Ian, do you wish to return? If you wish to return, you must see in a new light. Words appeared in front of my eyes. God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. I thought, God is light. Could that possibly be God? And in him, there's no darkness at all. I've just come from darkness. Whoever this being is, he is completely separate from darkness. I see no shadow. I see no evil, only pure white radiance. And he knows my name. Could it possibly be God that I'm standing in the presence of, talking to? I thought if it is, he must be able to see my spirit absolutely naked. He must see everything. I began to pull back. As I began to pull back towards the darkness of the tunnel, I watched a wave of radiance come off him. I expected it to touch me and literally catapult me back into the pit. But as this wave of light emanated forth off him, it moved through me. And all I got was love. The love was causing me to literally blubber. I was actually just blowing my eyes out. And I could feel an acceptance coming. I said, God, you can't love me. I've cursed you. More love. I said, oh, I've committed all kinds of sins. I've slipped around, I've taken drugs, more. As the love kept coming, I then literally divulged the, what I knew to be the most debauched things in my life. As the light began to open up, I became aware that, that standing in the center, I began to make out a man's bare feet. Around his ankles were dazzling white robes, garments. Not garments of cloth, but garments of light. As I looked out and saw that, I began to lift my face up to see the chest of a man and, and his arms are outstretched with dazzling white robes as if to welcome me. As I looked, I knew that I was looking upon God. Such. You're just awestruck. You, you can't be prepared. You have no way you can be prepared to see this. You just, I stood in absolute amazement. And as I looked towards his head, his hair was white radiance. I out of his face appeared to be light billowing forth, literally permeating out of like the, his entire face. You couldn't see the features of his face because the light was seven to ten times brighter than all the light I'd seen and it was literally um, uh, emanating forth from his face. I began walking closer towards him. I wondered if well, I could just see his face. I'll know who God is. As I got within a few feet of his presence, I began to place my face into the light. As my, and it didn't hurt your eyes. It was like you could look into it. As I placed my face closer in towards his face, hoping I'd break through that veil, as my face did, he suddenly moved. I saw an opening in a circular shape like a window into eternity or a door into eternity. As I looked through this, I could see an entire new earth open up before me. It was like I was standing on the threshold of eternity and I was getting a glimpse into it. As I'm looking, I can see grass with the same light and life emanating forth from it. I can see flowers, fields. I knew if I stepped on the grass, it would not damage it. The color and the energy and the life emanating from it. I, it was amazing. I see a, ri a river or a crystal clear stream, trees along its banks, rolling hills to the left. I look out to my right, mountains in the distance, blue, blue sky, crystal clear. I'm standing there and I'm going, this is paradise. As I'm looking, I know that I belong here. It's like I knew I had been created by God to live here. I thought, why wasn't I born here in the first place? Why was I born on this earth? I knew I'd come home. I knew I'd travel the world looking for that paradise. And here it was in front of me. I thought, I'm home. I'm home. As I started to move in, his presence came right back in front of me and blocked the way.
he asked me this question. He said, Ian, now that you've seen, do you wish to go in or do you wish to return? God. I'm not married. I've got no children. There's nothing for me to return back for. I don't want to go back. As I look back, to my amazement, God showed me one person that had loved me. The moment I saw my mother directly behind me, I wept. I thought, I've just not only lied to God, but there is someone who loved me. And I thought, if I'm dead, and this is actually happening, and I step through into paradise, into the presence of God, will my dear mother have any idea that her heathenistic son prayed in that ambulance, repented of his sins, gave his life over to God, and God heard this young man and caught him up into paradise? I thought, my mother will think her son went to hell. I thought she'd get a, a telegram or a telex saying, your son died last night. Would you like him ship time in a box or a jar of ashes? I thought if that happens, it could destroy her. She's suffered so much, she's lost her family. And I thought, near I, her, how selfish would it be for me to step through and leave my mother to bury me and think I went to hell? I want to go back. I was instantaneously back in my physical form in a hospital with the doctor that had been working on me holding my right foot in the air with a sharp instrument like a scalpel or a knife prodding the base of my foot. I could feel nothing, prodding it like a dead piece of meat. Genesis. I hear the voice of God into the thought and he said this, son, I've just given your life back. I went, what? I thought, I've just seen God. What's happening here? I felt an amazing power go through me. It was like a, a low voltage of electricity. I felt my entire body starting to feel again. And within a few hours, I was completely healed. I said, God, what have I become? He said, you're a reborn Christian. He said, you only came in because your sins have been forgiven and the blood of Jesus covered you the sacrifice, the atonement of Christ Jesus had covered your sins. You walked into his presence as if you were white as snow. I said, he stepped aside. He said, 2 Peter chapter 3, 10 to 18, God has created a new heaven and a new earth for those who love him. He said, this old earth will pass away. This body will pass away. But God said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Death, where is your sting? Death is swallowed up. How? Through the power of the resurrection of Jesus. The sting of death is sin, but the free gift of God is of those who repent of their sins, their sins will be forgiven, and they will step through into eternity. To live is Christ, to die is gain. <laughs> Who have I beside you, Lord? And I just went, man. He said, a new earth and a new heaven and a new Jerusalem, the city of our God, shall descend out of the new heavens onto the new earth, and there'll be no more sickness, no more suffering, no more death, and no more war, and we shall dwell with him throughout all eternity. And there is a river of life flowing from the throne of God, and those who drink from it, it's eternal life. So it's very, very easy to go to heaven. You just have to make it, have to, well, the Bible talks about being born again, to receive Jesus into your heart, to receive the Holy Spirit into your heart, and simply become a new creation 
those are all technical words, but it's very simple. You just simply have this, just simply say a simple little prayer to, to the Lord, to ask the Lord to come into your life, to take over your life, to acknowledge Him as the Lord, and He died for us. And then they'll go to heaven. It's as simple as that. Jesus said you can be converted. In the book, and it says that we can be saved. Jesus talked about being born again. It happened to me 20, oh, 26 years ago. and it, Well, it changed my life then, but talking to all these people who have been to heaven and other people who have been to hell has had a huge impact on me. It's changed my life dramatically, and my wife. And, you know, we spent a lot of time abroad every year. About half the year we're traveling, just talking to people about, mainly about heaven and hell. And incidentally, it's, it's talking to people about hell that causes me to actually travel to many, many countries of the world. Because I, want, I think people should know that there's a place to avoid. You know, to be honest, there were two thieves on the cross. One laughed at Jesus on the cross, and he's in hell now. The other one said a short prayer to Jesus on the cross, and he's in heaven now. Big difference, and it's forever. Perhaps most compelling of all, and the only true evidence has been the actual real life accounts. Stories like Daniel Ekechukwu's that we saw today and that of Ian McCormick have changed forever our perceptions of death and the life beyond. God, demons, a kingdom of darkness, a kingdom of light, fact or fiction, you decide. And whatever choice you make based on what you've seen, one thing is very clear. What we do on earth really does echo throughout eternity. I'm Ron Bailey. Thank you for watching The Lazarus Phenomenon.